Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the first of this year's Saturday Scholars. So today we have a, a double act, uh, Maricel Moreno and Tom Anderson. Both came to Notre Dame uh, now, uh, this is their 22nd year, uh, they're hoping for parole sometime soon. Uh, indeed, Tom has parole. He's just finished a stint uh, of six years uh, as chair of the Department of Romance, Languages and Literature uh, and is on leave this year, uh, and boy, does he deserve it. Uh, his own work uh, uh, has been covered a wide range of issues. Uh, his first book, uh, Everything in Its Place, The Life and Works of Virgilio Pinheiro, appeared in 2006, the first comprehensive study of one of Cuba's leading writers and thinkers of the 20th century. And his second book, Carnival and National Identity in the Poetry of Afro-Cubanismo, uh, is a major contribution to our understanding of Cuban literature and culture. He published uh, just uh, three years ago uh, a volume of Pinheiro's uh, co correspondence, uh, and he is currently working on a book about images of the US civil rights movement in Cuban poetry. Maricel Moreno is the Reverend John A. O'Brien, Associate Professor in Romance Languages. Her book, Family Matters, Puerto Rican Women Authors on the Island and the Mainland, was published in 2012. She's received the Indiana Governor's Award for Service Learning, the Shidi Excellence in Teaching Award, the College of Arts and Letters' highest award for teaching in 2016, and just this last year, she received the Reverend William A. Tui CSC Award for Social Justice. Her work is concerned with Latino, Latina, Caribbean authors, as well as Afro-Latinx uh, writers in US and Central America. Their talk today, Listening to Puerto Rico, emerges out of an extraordinary teaching project that they developed uh, to, with, in collaboration with the University of Michigan to try to see ways in which they could inform people about the history and reality of Puerto Rico. Tom and Marisa. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Yes, um, good morning, and thank you for being here. I do want to start by saying, uh, you know, Maricel and I have been here for 22 years at Notre Dame. This is our 22nd year, uh, actually, and many people have said over the years, like, you know, how do you guys do this? Like, I, some people even said things like, I can't imagine how difficult it would be to be in the same department, to be in similar fields, uh, to work with the same people, to share the same home office, et cetera, et cetera. But to us, it's really been a blessing. You know, we've been involved in a lot of... Uh, academic projects together and this particular project the listening to Puerto Rico uh, comes not just from our own deep uh, academic and intellectual interests in Puerto Rico but also because Maricel is from there uh, we have family there we go several times a year um, so we have you know a really deep spiritual emotional uh, connection uh, with the island and today we're going to be speaking uh, I'm just going to start with a brief introduction and then we're just going to kind of casually share the stage and talk about what this project entailed and what it was all about. And, you know, also we should start by thanking the College of Arts and Letters and the university for the tremendous support with this project. I mean, this is what we would call um, a digital engaged piece of scholarship. And, uh, you know, putting something like this together takes a lot of time, a lot of hours, and a lot of money. And, you know, we don't like to focus too much on the cost of something like this. But you know, without the support, the financial support of, of the college and the university, something like this would have been uh, impossible. And this is you know, part of the, the point of digital scholarship, engaged scholarship, is to get the university to back these types of things um, and, and help us to spread the word about important social um, and political issues. So you know, listening to Puerto Rico, and I guess we can go to the first slide here, is an example, like I said, of engaged scholarship. Uh, Ernest Boyer cur uh, coined the term uh, and we're going, to keep, we're going to keep the slides with a lot of text to a minimum, but uh, engage scholarship to describe teaching and research that connect the rich resources of the university to our most pressing social, civic, and ethical problems. Engage scholars aim to share knowledge and expertise not just with other academics or with academic communities, but more importantly, with the general public and with those who are impacted by pressing issues and shared problems. So the Listening to Puerto Rico project you know, is, is a perfect example of this type of scholarship and it also engages, we think, very well with the university's mission, 
which states that, and I quote, the university seeks to cultivate in its students not only an appreciation for the great achievements of human beings, but also a disciplined sensibility to the poverty, injustice, and oppression that burden the lives of so many. The aim is to create a sense of human solidarity and concern for the common good that will bear fruit as learning becomes service to justice. So, you know, the real idea of a project like this is that we take what, you know, we consider to be our academic uh, intellectual expertise on Puerto Rico, instead of sharing it just with the typical academic audience that we might uh, share a talk about our book or our latest article about literature, this is something that we can share with a much uh, broader public, and it's an issue that, that, you know, of course, impacts many, many people, as you'll see. Right. So we're going to go on to the next uh, slide here, yeah. just real briefly. So recently, an issue in the Chronicle of Higher Education uh, came out, and it says, you know, do universities value public engagement? Not so much, their policies suggest. And the reason I bring this up is because part of what we want to do with this project, and Marcel's going to talk a little bit more about this in a second, is to encourage, and we've given this same talk at many universities, many venues over the last year or so, is to encourage universities to support this type of research because we feel like it's very, very important, uh, and this type of scholarly project. So scholarly, scholarly work that serves the public is the kind of thing that theoretically universities want faculty members to pursue, but a new study of the languages uh, uh, used, of the language, sorry, used by more than 100 colleges in their tenure and promotion criteria shows little evidence that such scholarship is valued in a way that advances faculty careers. So this is kind of part of what, what our project is, to encourage more work like this and to encourage universities to, uh, to make it count, so to speak. Right. So let's um, talk a little bit about the main objectives of um, listening to Puerto Rico. Um, first and foremost, we wanted to provide basic background information about Puerto Rican history, culture, and society, uh, particularly through the Puerto Rico 101 section of the Teach Out. Um, this all came um, as a result of, this all happened as a result of the impact of Hurricane Maria and Irma on the island. So that was also another priority for us to raise awareness about the ongoing impacts of these hurricanes on the island. Um, we also wanted to promote action among learners. So it wasn't just, the idea wasn't just, okay, take the course and learn a lot about Puerto Rico, but we wanted to have that learning be inspiration for action among the people who took the course. And finally, as Tom has been uh, mentioning, we wanted to, also, we discovered along the way that we wanted to start helping change the narrative around engaged scholarship um, to encourage other academics to undertake similar projects uh, and to convince university administrators that this work has value and it's important. It's very easy for us to uh, remain secluded in, on the, in the ivory tower and it's very, very important for us to connect with communities so that those are basically the main objectives. And one of the things that we've run into actually in some of the talks that we've given are say an assistant professor will come up to us and say, you know, I want to do a, a project like this, but I'm afraid that if I do, it will impact my tenure case because for tenure I have to have this, 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 this. And the point is that somehow uh, it'd, be, it'd be nice if universities could start thinking about their promotion criteria and include, not that this type of work would replace those other things, but that somehow it could be defined as the type of work that, 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 can, that can count. So the next five minutes or four minutes or so, we're gonna watch two promotional videos. The first video is a one and a half minute video that was shown last year on the Jumbotron of the Notre Dame Stadium during the Notre Dame Michigan game. The teach out uh, was a free massive online uh, course called a MOOC, no, I'm, in a minute I'm gonna give a little better addition, uh, definition of a teach out, but the teach out coincided with the one year anniversary of Hurricane Maria which was the 20th uh, of September 2017 when it hit, and it was available online from the end of August till the end of September 2018. And so this video that you're about to see was one in which the presidents of the two universities uh, participated to promote the online course that was available at the time. And, and then the second video that we'll see afterwards, uh, a short uh, promo video is the one that was created in-house at Notre Dame for the Notre Dame public. Exactly. 
On September 20th, 2017, Hurricane Maria ravaged the island of Puerto Rico. In an effort to learn from those affected by the storm, the University of Notre Dame and the University of Michigan are collaborating on the Listening to Puerto Rico Teach Out. In June of 2018, our universities went to Puerto Rico to talk to people across all walks of life, to hear, in their own words, how their communities have banded together in the wake of the storm. In response to these stories, we're challenging our university communities to join this online learning event and connect with organizations on the ground to help the many people still on the road to recovery. Michigan's public mission calls for our university to advance human understanding and contribute to a better society. And Notre Dame's distinctive mission calls us to be a force for good in the world and respond to the demands of justice. Together, we will examine the challenges of infrastructure, policy, culture, and economics. And what each of us can do to help Puerto Rico's continued recovery. Please join us in this unique learning opportunity. That's the one that was used, like we said, for the um, for the promo that was shown on the jumbotron. And, and you know, part of the you know what we really wanted to do is to be sure that this uh, was well um, advertised. And you know, the 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 dream of kind of having this on the jumbotron came out when we were kind of planning the original the, the course of the early stages. And it seemed like a long shot, but it ended up being shown with a little glitch, but it it showed. And this is the promo. <laughs> Estábamos rodeados de agua. Sí, parecía un desierto. Nosotros, esto aquí es bien húmedo y, y parecía que lo hubiesen pegado un fósforo. O sea, no había una hoja. La que ya emocionalmente el país estaba en pedazos. Y entonces llega esto que de verdad destruye el país. Y ahí vimos el sufrimiento el dolor, la pobreza que hay en este país. María sacó para afuera la desigualdad que hay en Puerto Rico. What people want to be heard. They want to talk, they want to share what they've learned, and they want to share their hope for a better future for Puerto Rico. Fue la sociedad civil, aquí y afuera, en nuestra diáspora extendida, con todos nuestros aliados que ustedes movilizaron y que acá se movilizó también, la que salvó este país y la que lo sigue salvando. O sea, no se puede hacer nada sin la diáspora. Nada. Aquí lo que hace falta son recursos para completar lo que ya empezamos, porque desde el día uno hemos estado trabajando. Es una de las cosas que más me preocupa y estoy loco por... por por arrancar de nuevo el vivero para, para darle empleo a, lo, a la gente del barrio. Today, a very powerful day. I think it was really uh, impressive once again how they're just in all the with all the loss and the misery and the suffering. There's a lot of uh, positive messages. Casa Pueblo, pues está en, estamos desarrollando una insurrección energética. Hay que cambiar el cuento, hay que tratar de, de narrar, sí, la marginación sostenida, pero también el valor sostenido del país y lo que nosotros podemos dar al mundo y lo que es rentable para ser autosustentables y tomar el, el, las riendas de este nuevo país en las manos nuestras. En Puerto Rico, desde el 21 de septiembre, a pocas horas de que pasara el huracán María, se vio de manera contundente cómo fueron las mismas comunidades las que trabajaron por ellas mismas para literalmente sobrevivir. 
Listening to Puerto Rico is learning about the past and the present and solving the future. So the, the next uh, part, you know, I want to talk a little bit about the teach out and what a teach out is because when we were asked, actually, you know, as soon as the uh, hurricane hit, the, one of the first reactions that Maricel and I had naturally was we have to do something. I mean, it was, it was so overwhelming, the, the amount of destruction and the, and the despair. I mean, her own family members, uh, you know, two of whom have passed away since the hurricane because of a lack of access to sufficient medical um, facilities. And, you know, so we, we had all of the Puerto Rican students at our house, uh, graduate and undergraduate, we brainstormed, what can we do? So, you know, there was a mass at the Basilica. There was a panel with faculty and students to, to kind of inform people about it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we thought we got to go to the island, but going to the island was so difficult. H homes were destroyed. The apartment where we usually stayed was badly damaged. You know, it was just, feet on the ground just didn't seem like a reasonable uh, response to this disaster because things on the island were so bad. So, you know, we appealed to the university in, in, in a way. We, we went in May of 2018, uh, March of 2018 for the first time, and we realized that, you know, when we were there, people wanted to talk. I mean, everywhere we went, people wanted to tell their stories about the, the experience with the storm, the damage, um, but, but we kept hearing all these stories of resilience. Like, yeah, I lost my whole house. I, lo I, I lost my farm. I lost everything, but, but I'm gonna march forward. And, you know, I met my community that I hadn't, people in the community I never knew before, and the families are together. So. So we were thinking, you know, what can we do? So here comes uh, an opportunity. Uh, our colleague and friend, Elliot Visconsi, uh, Chief Academic Digital Officer here at Notre Dame, and Sonia Howell uh, had gone to the University of Michigan uh, to participate in a workshop about the different genres of teach-outs. And here I'd like to just pause to talk a little bit about what a teach out is, and then I'll continue with the backstory. So I'll, I'll just read the definition. Basically, you know, Elliot approaches us after going to this thing with Sonia Howell at Michigan saying, you know, I got this great idea. We want you and you and Maricel to do a teach out about Puerto Rico. And we're like, what the heck's a teach out? I had no idea. So, uh, so a teach out is a free online, free open online learning event intended to activate public engagement around timely social issues. The University of Michigan Office of Academic Innovation created the Teach Out series in 2017 as a way to engage a global audience in contemporary topics online. The series has featured a range of events uh, that are free, short form, uh, self-paced learning opportunities on topics such as fake news, sleep deprivation, the opioid crisis, opioid crisis, crisis at the border, uh, extreme weather, and of course, uh, Puerto Rico now sometimes referred to as just-in-time mini-courses because they really happen right when you know, the topic is relevant. Uh, the typical teach-out, Michigan has now offered uh, over 2,000, uh, capitalizes on faculty expertise to impart knowledge about pressing issues and topics. So, this, uh, Elliot Visconsi, uh, talking to his uh, counterpart at Michigan, uh, brought up the possibility of conducting, yes, they wanted to collaborate, so they, he brought up Puerto Rico. How about doing this teach out on Puerto Rico? And um, Michigan was on board right away, and they started, you know, they, that's when they approached us. Uh, Elliot Visconsi uh, wrote to us asking us if we wanted to be part of this. We had no idea what a teach out was, but we said, whatever we can do to raise awareness about what's happening in Puerto Rico, we'll be very happy to participate in that. Uh, we were not really sure what we were getting into. Uh, so it just so happened that, you know, we, we talked a lot and decided that we wanted to flip the, the script, the typical script of a teach out, because as we said, it's usually faculty centered, right? But we said, well, we are experts on Puerto Rico. Uh, we were not there during the hurricane. We certainly cannot claim expertise about this. So. How about producing a teach out where what we do is elevate, you know, highlight the voices of Puerto Ricans who have actually lived through this experience. So that's how the idea came to the concept of listening. You know, let's, let's allow them to speak. And we decided to simply conduct interviews with a whole range of Puerto Ricans, different walks of life, right? Um, to, try to get a good sense of how they had experienced that event. 
So, the, so this whole teach out experience was really new to all of us. The, even the, the, the people who had been in, were involved in the University of Michigan hadn't been actively involved in teach outs in the past. And, you know, there was a lot of discussion, you know, so we had a lot of meetings. We kind of brainstormed at one point. We come up with the idea of listening, but then we're like, okay, but to what? <laughs> what are we going to listen to? We can't just say, hey, tell us about the hurricane because you just don't know where people are going to go. It, it ended up being a little free form like this, but we had to come up with some topics that we wanted people to address. But we, I like to show this slide because it really captures the essence of what we were trying to do. We knew that listening was at the core of it. We were not sure what themes were going to emerge out of that. And we did not want to drive it ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we needed to wait until the interviews were conducted in order to see what, you know, what were the themes that emerged over and over um, throughout the interviews. And, and one other thing I would add, because I think the whole process of putting a class like this together is very important. You know, the, the amount of time we invested, it's really been the better part of a, of a year that we've put into to, to putting this course together, to, to conducting the interviews, to editing them, to subtitling them, to putting them together in units, to putting it online, to then migrating everything to a web page. But one of the things that, that just was really important from the beginning is we need to listen and not impose ideas, not impose our faculty knowledge. And, and also, you know, we thought from the, at the beginning, the Michigan people said, why don't we send Notre Dame and Michigan students down with iPhones and just have them interview people all over the island? And we thought about that very seriously, but then, the, you know, the people that do the interviews need to know a lot about Puerto Rico and, and need to have a deep sensitivity and a knowledge of the history and, and the language. Uh, and I also said, we, we also thought we need to have videos well-filmed videos so they can so they can last and so they can be used right. uh, in a classroom setting. So, you know, we did a lot of brainstorming. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about just kind of how uh, that whole... No, we don't need to uh, spend too much time here. We were, you know, these were just some of the, just kind of to show some of the brainstorming uh, sessions we had prior to heading down to Puerto Rico last uh, it's summer, June of uh, 2018. And, and highlighting the whole idea of collaboration with Michigan, which was really interesting because, you know, this was all set around the Notre Dame Michigan football team. We hadn't played for four years, and so much was made, probably too much. You know, there were articles published, you know, rivals uh, on the field, but collaborators in the classroom kind of thing. But it, it worked. We played this up a lot, you know, the rivalry with Michigan. Yeah, we collaborated, uh, but it was also, you know, a little bit of competition. I mean, for... <laughs> Quite a lot. Like, when, when they when they heard that we were going to Puerto Rico to conduct interviews and film them, then they decided to send their own crew to, to conduct their interviews. But they arrived two days later than we did. And so. we gave them the list of people. That, <laughs> we gave them the list of people they, could in, they, they should interview. So yes, it, it, it is funny it, because funny. there was some very healthy competition, you yes. know, just, just like on the field. Yeah. So we're going to go just very quickly through. We'll skip over some, but just some of the, the, the interviews we had, the first uh, interview we had, and, and the map shows kind of the basic location of, of each interview. We wanted to interview a, a wide variety of people from different socioeconomic uh, levels to uh, different areas of the island, et cetera. And the first one we had was with Jose Fernandez, who is a Notre Dame grad, an ex-member of the Board of Trustees, emeritus member of the uh, Board of Trustees, and the founding, um, the, uh, the founder of Kinesis Foundation, which Maurice Hall can talk a little bit about, because it's a really important work that he and his foundation are doing in Puerto Rico, pre and post Maria. Yes, uh, so Kinesis Foundation, uh, is an organization that helps students. Uh, they started helping high school students, but they have continued to expand, and now they, they start even in middle school and, and before that, to help students throughout the island in underprivileged, who are underprivileged and are going to underprivileged schools, mostly public schools, uh, to um, just kind of plan for the future, you know? And, and they provide a lot, you know, thousands of dollars in scholarships for students to uh, attend university, whether it's in the US or you know, anywhere across the world actually. But they, they have done incredible work even you know, prior to Hurricane Maria. Um, but once the hurricane hit, they saw that their students and the teachers that they work with and the counselors at schools that they work with were all impacted. Many of these people were from really poor areas of Puerto Rico, mostly the interior. So they did something that was really fascinating, which is that they went out with a camera crew trying to find their students. Yeah, many the, were the missing. Ones, the mean, ones that, who were missing uh, and their families and bringing provisions, but they filmed it. So they ended up producing like a mini documentary 
that that is striking. I mean, because it, it was filmed just days after Maria, and and it's really raw um, and captures really well the desperation and the urgency of that moment. So um, and we one, talked about all that with him. And one thing about this particular video is that they used drones to f to film the devastation of nature. And in some of the places they went, I mean, even still, you know, not to be over dramatic, but watching the video, you know, brings tears to our eyes. It's is really unbelievable the defoliation that took place, for example, in the mountains in Puerto Rico. I mean, every single tree lost every single leaf. So for months, it was just brown in one of the greenest places on earth. And, and you know, that, the psychological damage of that was, was very profound and continues to be for many people. So we learned a lot from him during that interview. Um, we, had, we did not know anything about the documentary they had filmed, so we were able to watch it. Uh, and that was linked to the Listening to Puerto Rico teach out too, so people could see it. And one thing I would just say in passing, we steered clear of politics whenever possible. We didn't want to drive this, the conversations with the people on the island into political themes if we didn't need to, but it came up over and over. And actually, Fernandez, uh, we were going to film outside and he said, I want you to sit down and I want you to sit in front of this screen with President Trump throwing paper towel to the people of my hometown because this was still, this is, this is considered by many people to be an incredible front. You know, just blocks away, people's houses were underwater, and the whole visit was, was, a really, was really impactful, so. So uh, then we interviewed uh, author uh, Mayra Santos Febres, who's one of, perhaps like, uh, one of the most important literary figures on the island, and she has, had been producing uh, directing the Festival de la Palabra for several years, and the hurricane hit right before, like two weeks before the festival was about to take place. This festival brings in Latin American authors, uh, you know, from all from all of Latin America, and, and it um, it's a festival that where they partner with uh, organizations, uh, with schools, etc. It's a really well uh, organized festival, but. Of course, everything had to be canceled because of the hurricane. So what they did, what she did, was then bring the festival to the people, so especially schools. So they realized the trauma that children and the youth had been, you know, ha had gone through uh, as a result of the hurricane, and they 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 went to the schools. They talked about the power of reading, the power of writing. Had the kids write themselves and. It was a very cathartic process. So we talked a lot about that um, with her. And one of the main topics that came up in her talk and others, and, and we're, we'll, we're not gonna talk about all our interviews, of course, but these are kind of the, some of the most important ones, is that she stressed the importance of the diaspora, which, which are all the Puerto Ricans that live off of the island. And historically, there's been a lot of tension between Puerto Ricans living on the mainland and Puerto Ricans living on the island. Kind of this, you know, are you really Puerto Ricans? You know, there's a lot of national identity issues. And the Puerto Rican diaspora has been really, really, really important in the recovery of the island. So this is a theme that came up uh, over and over. Um, um, we visited, we have to go through yeah. this because we have very little we'll time. Do Casa uh, one of the uh, places we visited was Casa Pueblo. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of them, but this is an organization that started back in the 70s. Uh, uh, back then, their objective was to protect the land. Uh, they're in, located in, a, in the center of the island, mountainous region. And back then, there was uh, the possibility of uh, the government doing some mining in the area, so they managed to uh, create you know, reserves. And if you look at a map of all of the areas that they have been able to secure and protect throughout Puerto Rico, it's really amazing. Their latest project is um, solar energy and renewable energy. So they are really at the forefront of that. And because they had installed panels uh, years ago, they became an energy oasis after the storm, after the hurricane. People were able to, they actually saved lives because people were able to come there to um, refrigerate medicines, you know, that needed to be refrigerated. They were able to, people were able to connect with family members because they had plugs, people could charge their cell phones, uh, et cetera, et cetera. They also provided they they received a lot of help from all over the world because people were aware of them and they were able to distribute like a 
30,000 or 30, so. 30,000 solar lamps to each family that came by to get one. Um, and they also distributed small refrigerators and put them in, located them in around the area so that neighbors could join together and um, store their medicines, you know, that needed to be stored in, in refrigerators. So, so they did a lot. And, and we should point out, we went in June 2018. The hurricane was in September 2017. Many people in Adjunta still did not have power or running water when we were doing the interviews. So that was almost an entire year later. People were living, uh, and, and Casa Pueblo has been instrumental uh, in this. So we visited a, a barber shop uh, that is powered, that was powered by uh, Casa Pueblo too. Uh, so now they're, they're ready, you know. Um, we kind of have to fly through this. This is an important right. interview. Very quickly, we, we interviewed Marcel's aunt, um, uh, Brenda, the one sitting down on the left. Uh, their family experience, and they're the ones who provided the, the, the footage of the storm for a promotional video. The entire area where they live was completely underwater. And uh, her husband, Maricel's uncle, uh, su suffered from severe uh, diabetes and has passed away since the hurricane because of lack of access to dialysis, because there was no electricity. Uh, her sister also pa uh, has passed away uh, since the storm uh, for similar reasons. So, you know, this is a very personal, but also a very typical story of, you know, the Puerto Rican suffering uh, post Hurricane Maria. Um. So her son, um, Juan Francisco Catalá, who's my cousin, uh, he's a third generation farmer, coffee farmer. Uh, unlike his father and grandfather, he, he has uh, decided to have a nursery, a coffee nursery instead of a farm. So everything you know, begins with, with the seeds uh, when you're planting coffee and he lost basically all of, all of his plants. You know? So like, it was absolute destruction for him. Uh, so we, we wanted to get the perspective of, of, um, of a farmer. Well, and, yeah. and part of the reason we wanted that perspective is because 80% of the agricultural land in Puerto Rico was completely destroyed. I mean, he lost, he lost 150,000 coffee plants uh, you know, starting from scratch, his story was one of thousands. I mean, this, it just so happened we had a personal connection with him. So his interview, actually, I think of all of them that, are, that were on the course site, was probably about the most uh, popular in terms of people really being impacted uh, by his story. Yeah. And he also spoke to us about the other disasters of the agricultural yeah. zone in which he lives. You know, the banana plantations that were completely and absolutely destroyed, pineapple, uh, papaya, uh, coconuts, uh, coffee, everything, sugar. So these are just more pictures of that interview. This is in front, that, and this, this one I think we should say just a word. We can go to the, the one in, the, in Guanica. This is just because the, the story is so incredible. We had been recommended that we speak to some fishermen in Puerto Rico to talk about the, the, um, the impact on the fishing industry, and we hadn't set up an interview with them, and we were walking around the port of this town of Guanica, and the man who's sitting on the right-hand side of this uh, image came up to us and said, are you guys from the University of Notre Dame? Oh, he had no, this one. This, yeah, that one. Yeah. He had recognized the logos on our shirts, and we said yes, and he just couldn't believe it. His granddaughter had graduated from the university in 2017, and he happened to be a fisherman from the town of Guanica, and so we sat down and spoke to him uh, and one of his colleagues about the way that it impacted the fishing industry. And what's most interesting about this particular case is that you see the location in the southwest corner of Puerto Rico was one of the least affected by the storm itself. The winds were much weaker, the rain was uh, much lighter, but still they were five months without electricity, yeah. this, this part of the island. So yeah. everybody was impacted. Yes. Uh, and then we conducted towards the end of the, we were filming for four days. It was Monday, Monday through Thursday, mm -hmm. really. Uh, so we, we did a lot of filming during that time, and we ended up in Old San Juan and spoke to another author, Magali Garcia Ramis, and to a reporter of the Center for Investigative Journalism. Um, this organization, this nonprofit, had just uh, uh, sued the Puerto Rican government so that they could obtain the records of all of the dead after the hurricane so that they could conduct an investigation because up to that moment, the Puerto Rican government was still claiming that there had only been like 60 64. some, 64 deaths uh, connected to the hurricane when everyone knew that it was in the thousands. And they ended up conducting that investigation. But at this moment, they had just won uh, that lawsuit. 
So then, you know, after all of the interviews and the, the visit to Puerto Rico, we, we returned to campus and really had to just throw this thing together. You know, I mean, literally we had about six weeks to get the course yeah, <laughs> put together and, and it was really frantic. I mean, it, it, the, the, first of all, just getting all the videos, um, making the promotional videos, getting all the videos cut, uh, editing them, uh, putting them in subtitles, then getting them up on the, the Coursera course. Uh, designing the course, making it available so that by the 27th of uh, August, which was the opening date, it would be then uh, available to anybody in the world who wanted to take it, which, you know, Michigan took care of all yeah. of that. But so it was it was very frantic. And, and we also this is very important. At this point, we didn't have any kind of history of Puerto Rico uh, on, on the you know, we hadn't done interviews about that. So we decided that we were going to put together a, a course called Puerto Rico 101. And they said, OK, we'll give you five minutes. You can do a five minute, do a five minute history of Puerto Rico, and we'll have it as the beginning of the course. Well, you know, we prevailed and got 25 minutes, which was still it's very more difficult. Like 23, I 23, think. something yeah. like that. So we also had to film, still not enough. professionally film the Puerto Rico 101 uh, course. So all this happened in like six weeks. We shouldn't show that because it's no, we won't show that. Uh, but you can go to it. We had it here in case we had time, but we're realizing we we need to keep going here. Uh, but you can just go visit the website and see the Puerto Rico 101 segment. And, and real quick about Puerto Rico 101, we're not going to show any, I mean, it's 23 minutes. We were thinking maybe show a short clip. But what I will say is that, you know, in this is literally Puerto Rico 101 because we realized even in our own classes, people don't know Puerto Ricans are citizens of the United States. People don't know where Puerto Rico is. People don't know what the native language of Puerto Ricans is. People don't know what the island looks like. I'm not saying everybody, but a lot of people don't. And as a matter of fact, um, you know, we felt like this kind of course cannot exist without some sort of background. So we're answering questions like, what is Puerto Rico? Uh, where is Puerto Rico? How many people live there? Is it a colony? Is it a country? Is it a nation? Is it a state? So this is, this yeah. is the, the purpose of this. Mm -hmm. So to give, provide people with um, some sort of background, right? Before listening to the, to the interviews. So then we had the teach out. It happened, it was about a month that mm -hmm. the course was up on Coursera and we had over a thousand learners enrolled, uh, over 500 quote unquote active learners. Um, you know, you see the numbers here. But what's interesting is that, you know, as professors of literature, we have what, um, tops 40 students a semester. Uh, you know, so this was a way to reach a lot of people in a very short time. So we really appreciated that. Yeah, and I would also say, you know, that the active learners, 546 active learners, means they completed most of the course. This is 30 hours of interviews, quizzes, uh, hundreds and hundreds of pages of articles. And there were 363 total posts on the site, which was incredible. I mean, all the questions, the comments, the answers, the dialogue. So it was really a, it was truly a class and, and yeah. a lot of people. And, and of course, the, the good thing about the Coursera site was that it you know, produced all this information, which we're not really gonna go through, but just the idea that we then have the numbers, where were people coming from? And we were very surprised to see who was taking this course, people from all over the world. Yeah. And, and this was one of the beauties of this type of teaching. Yeah, so gender, age, age, you know, um, location, mostly North America, but Puerto Rico, Canada, Mexico, Australia, Oceania, Africa, South America, Europe, Asia. So from the United Kingdom, you know, so there were people yeah. from all over. Um, all right. So we should probably move on to talk about. Yeah. So, so in addition to the, the uh, online course, we decided to plan a series of events throughout the semester. We began with faculty panel, uh, mostly Puerto Rican faculty, except, except for, me. for you. Um, he's <laughs> honorary Puerto Rican. Uh, and so we had this event the, the, the day, day before, before the, game. the Michigan game. So right? all of this was live streamed. You know, this was, all poured, this was all part of the course. So people who took the course could either watch this live or then it was made available on the course. Another activity we did, which is great, it was the first time this was done at Notre Dame, was a live stream, um, kind of like a news show. These were all the Puerto Ricans uh, in, in, in a brand spanking new studio, no. Uh, these were all the Puerto Rican students who were in Puerto Rico uh, when the storm passed. No, there were I think more, we just one. had to choose. Yeah, we had to pick and choose, exactly. <laughs> so, these, so the point is that the, the, the course also involves students, uh, it involved faculty, uh, and, and all of this was made available 
uh, first live online and then uh, the, through video. We also had uh, Don, uh, Dr. Arturo Masol uh, from Casa Pueblo came and gave a lecture about the solar revolution. And the energy organized this event, mm -hmm. uh, but in, we co-sponsored it. Um, then we had a visit from a, a team from uh, the University of Sagrado Corazon in Puerto Rico. Uh, the president of the university uh, graduated from Notre Dame. Uh, mm -hmm. I forget what year, mm -hmm. but um, they did a lot to help the people uh, of Puerto Rico once, you know, they were really hit obviously, but then they took care of their students and then went, sent the students out uh, after this, the hurricane. So we wanted to hear from them how they dealt with the crisis. So that was also part of the series of events that we organized here on campus, followed by uh, the showing uh, of the documentary, the first showing of the documentary uh, after Maria, the two shores by Sonia Fritz was the first time it was shown outside of Puerto Rico, also all about the, the hurricane. And so then, you know, just very briefly, since the course actually has come offline and migrated to our listening to PuertoRico.org website, we continue to go back to Puerto Rico and are filming additional interviews. And one thing about this type of project is it's an ongoing thing. I mean, we're gonna be doing this, who knows, maybe forever. Uh, and, you know, people have commented that this kind of cache of videos that we have is like a little treasure, not only because of what people say, what people talk about, uh, what you can learn about all, all types of things, Puerto Rican art, history, culture, but also it's kind of a linguistic treasure trove because it captures accents from all over the island. It's a small place, but there are a lot of accents in Puerto Rico, so it's very interesting in that regard. And these are some additional interviews. So these are, yeah, uh, interviews we conducted after the actual course had uh, Without Almost. the camera crew, We're, we've become you know, now, now, we, videographers yeah. through this um, project. So this is another uh, important, and we've returned to the area of Loiza, which is highly Afro-Puerto Rican. Uh, it was uh, originally a town that, that was built by uh, former slaves, so, uh, and it was really hard hit, uh, also by Hurricane Irma two weeks before Maria. So we've returned there mm -hmm. to try to capture those voices, because those are voices also that even you know, part of what we were trying to do with this project was uh, by highlighting the voices of the people and the experiences of the people, it, it, this was a way to counter the, the narratives of both the Puerto Rican government, which was, had its own claims about the effects of the hurricane, but also the federal side, you know, what the U.S. government was saying about this disaster. So that's why we, in that spirit, we have returned mm -hmm. to continue to hear from people because there are still very concrete uh, um, effects of that hurricane to this day. And, and I would add real quickly, just I know we're conscious that we have just a couple minutes left and want to leave time for, for questions. The importance of this project, you know, it just continues to, um, I, I mean, I personally feel like it's some of the most important work I've ever done. It might not be the work that gets the most amount of credit. It might not be what, you know, gets me uh, national attention, but I feel like, you know, especially when you're going back a year, a year and a half later, and people are still bursting into tears when you're speaking to them about the storm. People are still desperate for help. People are still wondering when things are gonna get better. Um, so it, it, it's really something that's got real staying power. This is, you know, t 20, 30, 40 years from now, people will still be talking about Hurricane Maria. A hundred, a thousand years from now. This is a storm that has forever changed the face of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico will never be the same. It'll be 50, 60 years even before the trees recuperate from the incredible damage that they suffered. And in Puerto Rico, in the Puerto natural beauty is so important. And in Puerto Rico, people talk about, you know, the way we conceptualize the history of the island has become before Maria or after Maria, you know, so that is certainly a landmark. So we got some coverage uh, last Christmas uh, for the project, which was really good to have that in Puerto Rico. Um, but we wanted just to, you know, uh, emphasize that uh, besides everything else, you know, uh, this, there is a call to action and to us it's incredibly important that people go to this section of the website, the ACT section, and look at the ways that they can help the island. Uh, so that's always been mm -hmm. at the center of our uh, concerns. Um, some other uh, byproducts of uh, listening to Puerto Rico was, for instance, uh, uh, the Center for Social Concerns decided to have a listening to Puerto Rico Im uh, faculty immersion trip, and we organized that trip, um, and it happened last spring break. We had nine faculty mm -hmm. uh, members from all our, across the different units and institutes from the university, and we visited many of the same 
organizations that we had conducted interviews with for the teach out, as well as we added others that we had not been able to connect with uh, when we first went down to conduct interviews. And then Maricel, who has, well, this is part of the faculty immersion seminar. It was fabulous, actually. We went all over the island, and, and it was really a really powerful experience. But Maricel so, has um, put together an incredible... The other byproduct of listening to Puerto Rico was the creation of the first cross-cultural leadership program. This is commonly known as CICLIP. It used to be housed at the Center for Social Concerns, but the last few years it's been directed by the Institute for Latino Studies. And they were really interested uh, after the, we launched this project, they were really, in, ILS was really interested in establishing something in Puerto Rico. So um, through our connections with Sagrado Corazon, the president there, like I said, he's an alum, uh, and the alum, we created this new opportunity for students. It, says, it was a seven week uh, community-based learning course where students for the first three weeks took uh, a class that was specifically designed for this opportunity at the University of Sagrado Corazon in Puerto Rico with their professors. And they were living in the dorms, so they met a lot of you know, Puerto Rican uh, university students. So they took a class for three weeks, and then the following four weeks, they were doing volunteer work with specific organizations. Like there were th uh, two organizations, and they, did sub they were subdivided into three different groups. One of the groups conducted, uh, and let me just say that the area where they were doing all of this work for four weeks, it's one of the poorest areas of Puerto Rico, especially of, San Juan, of the San Juan area. Um, these are people who, uh, the majority are making under $10,000 per year. Uh, so it's, you know, very, very poor. So they were working there, one of their, subgroups work with a uh, water quality because this community lives is called El Caño and there is there are these bodies of water that um, have become contaminated over the decades and it floods very easily every time it rains it, houses flood and it impacts the quality of the water in the houses so my students uh, along with another faculty or researcher who's Puerto Rican in biology conducted this um, um, test to, you know, about water quality and the connection to gastro gastrointestinal intestinal yeah. diseases. Mm -hmm. And this is, so they set the groundwork when they were there for four weeks, but they are continuing to work on it. They are sending samples from Puerto Rico to the labs here at Notre Dame, and they're planning on producing papers and, and research on this topic. And, helping a lot the, the main organization under which this happened. Um, so uh, that's just one example of what, you know, they were doing fabulous things uh, this summer. And then two of them ended up, or three, ended up working at a clinic that also serves that community. So it's a very poor area. And they uh, conducted workshops on asthma, prevention of asthma and diabetes. Uh, one of them, uh, utilize this opportunity to conduct interviews for her own research. So we've seen uh, a lot of opportunities for students. Uh, eight of them, Notre Dame students, uh, participated in this uh, program. Here they are, along with uh, two faculty members from Sagrado Corazon, or three. Um, and we're really excited because these are obviously now partnerships that we want to continue to nurture. There is so much that uh, people at Notre Dame can learn from what's been uh, done in Puerto Rico right now, uh, especially with nonprofits and the other way around too. So we're like helping each other mm -hmm. that way. And we're hopefully, you know, uh, going to continue to have this program, but it was certainly a success for this first time that it took place. So I think now we can just kind of uh, open it up to questions. You know, this, the, the idea here is that you know, this uh, project is ongoing, it's very organic, uh, it's taken all sorts of forms, it started, you know, with a great idea from the Office of Digital Learning and turned into an online course, now uh, a permanent web page that's gotten, you know, lots and lots of visits. Our colleagues are using some of the videos in their classrooms. 
Uh, it's accessible to all of you if you're interested in seeing it, to watching the videos. There's hundreds and hundreds of pages of uh, documentation, articles, newspaper uh, about Puerto Rico and, and the hurricane. Uh, and then, of course, now we have faculty and students who are also getting involved because of this project. So, you know, that's, that's what we have for, for today, and I hope that some can stick around and ask uh, some questions, anything you'd like to ask. Thank you very much. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. No, they're, they're oh. So if you have any comments or questions. Yeah, they're, right, they're here in the middle. When you were talking about the, the interviews that you took, those are on, online. Yeah. That can, and we're talking about the different dialects. Mm -hmm. can, can you listen to them and understand them in English? Yeah, they're all subtitled. Oh. All, all of the interviews are subtitled. So the, the interviews were done, most of them okay. were done in Spanish. We let people choose. I mean, Except the last, the two recent ones that were uploaded don't have subtitles. because. This is all new to me, and now we're on our own. So I tried to upload to the website the interview with. Uh, and we put the wrong ones up. I put the wrong ones. But yeah, they're, they're they're accessible and they can be watched. You know, some are some are more interesting than others. You know, some are very short, some are longer. We in in, in after the course was online, we and we kind of rewatched the videos. We realized some of them were a little too long for for the general public. So as we've been going back to Puerto Rico, we've been keeping them much shorter. And, and we've got, you know, we keep going back. We're going to go back again in December and do 10 or 12 more. And, you know, eventually we'll have hundreds and hundreds of interviews of, of people about all sorts of topics. Are they going to use the information that you gathered and the things about helping these people and what they have to say for reference for new, you know, hurricane? You never know. I mean, that it's hard to know ideal. how they're going to use <laughs> what we've put up. It's, Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, once, that's, once that uh, study is uh, completed, they will probably present it to the Puerto Rican government because this particular community has been fighting for decades to uh, have uh, the area, El Dragado, how do you say uh, it? Dredged. Dredged. Mm -hmm. So this has been, like, the Puerto Rican government has kind of let down this community, so they've been mobilizing you know so that, that's the idea behind the this main organization is called enlace um, del caño martin peña so hopefully yeah they'll use it uh, in you know to advocate for their community uh, with the puerto rican government and hopefully publish it so that's why you know it's good to have this connection because our researcher here uh, i'm sure she'll like to publish something regarding this and then this would be a publication with Nordane undergraduates too, who are helping. So that that's all really good and promotes, you know, scholarship and mm -hmm. more attention on to that topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Puerto Rican governor resigned uh, three or four weeks ago, and there was a little bit of turmoil. But mm -hmm. I think now there is uh, a governor that recognizes legitimate. What about the politics in Puerto Rico now and going forward? Is, are, they, are they able to maybe help more in this relief effort? Or? Are they able to? I'm sorry, I didn't. Well, help the relief effort. You like know, the new governor. I, I mean, suppose oh. we could also mention that there was an indictment just last week mm -hmm. of this Oklahoma contractor and the FEMA director, who wasn't Latino. Mm -hmm. Uh, but local there. Mm -hmm. So is there, you know, I don't really get political to get, you know. But Impossible to avoid, frankly, yeah, seriously. It, but is there, uh, do you think the local government now is, is, is going to be able to help or what's the situation? So in Puerto Rico, people were very disappointed with how the local, gover how the local government dealt with the hurricane crisis and how the federal government dealt with it too. You know, it was, both of them did not do what they needed to do at that time. Um, under the, this new leadership, um, the new governor, things have definitely uh, stabilized some, um, but time will tell. What I can tell you is that 
the protests that we saw uh, calling for the resignation of the governor, those were historic. We had never seen anything like that on the island. And so many interviews were conducted with people and they said, you know, it's like Hurricane Maria took everything away from us. <laughs> it's like we have realized that as a people, we need to be fighting for our lives, even if it means getting rid of a governor who is corrupt and is not doing what he is supposed to be doing for the people, right? So there, there was a lot of like strength in, in numbers. Like this, I, I think this gave a lot of confidence to, to people on the island to, you know, say, we can do so much for us. And we, that, all of that came across in the interviews. Mm -hmm. Like when you listen to them, people are saying, yeah, the government, both, both of them failed, the local and the federal, but, but we got together, we, we formed community brigades and we would just, we collect food, we would go distribute it to the people who were in most need, like people organize. And there is a lot of talent, a lot of leadership there that is not being recognized or, or put to good use, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think that process in itself gave a lot of confidence to people and that's why people were able to go to the streets and demand change, right? But honestly, the bigger fight is with the US government because whether we like to admit it or not, Puerto Rico is a colony. And there are so many barriers in place that, that are obstacles for the island's uh, recovery, mm -hmm. you know? So one example would be the, the Merchant Marine Act of 1920, uh, uh, the Jones Act, commonly known as the Jones Act. There's another Jones Act of 1917 that is the act that gave us citizenship, right? U.S. citizenship. But the 1920 Act uh, limits uh, all commerce in Puerto Rico. Everything has to be brought in through by ship. And all those ships have to come from, they have to be U.S. owned, constructed, and manned ships that are coming from Florida from a very specific port, right? So even in the midst of Hurricane Maria, when there were so many countries around the world that were trying to send help, we were not able to receive that help because they were in ships that were not US ships. At that moment, President Trump uh, lifted the Jones Act the, for 10 days. So in those 10 days, the island was able to do that. But imagine, everyone talks about, that, this is a big fight, you know? Like we need to, Puerto Rico needs to be exempted from the, from the, um, uh, the Jones Act so that we can trade with others so that there's not so many restrictions because ultimately it's the Puerto Rican people who pay the price because the taxes are up the roof, you know, everything there is so much more expensive mm -hmm. than it is here, right? Because there's all this added, and that's just one example of something that's in place. The other thing would be, I mean, right, we cannot forget that the island was in the midst of an economic crisis when the, at the moment that the hurricane hit, right? So it was like insult to injury. And Puerto Rico used to be protected under banco bankruptcy law until like, I forget the exact date, but 1980 something, right? And at that point, the law was changed no rhyme or reason, and Puerto Rico was excluded from bankruptcy laws. So if we were able to do that, um, everything that has happened and the severe austerity measures that have taken place and all of that would have, would have uh, developed differently. You know? so, so there's, you know, that's why it's important to write to, to our representatives, you know, like the American, people can do a lot for Puerto Rico because in, on the island people cannot vote for the president. Primaries, yeah, but not for the president. So um, people can just, you know, advocate for the island in ways that the people there cannot. Do we have time for we one more? Go on. uh, let's, uh, last question. Yeah, 
question back here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the nature of it. This is to raise consciousness. And you had it on a Saturday. All the work that's been done here is incredible. Um, I'm sorry to bring this question up, but are you afraid that with the with the, uh, the issues in the Bahamas that this will be overshadowed? All the, I mean, how do you keep this going within the university as one program when, in fact, the average person now is seeing what in God's name is happening in the Bahamas, mm -hmm. and how does one address all this? And you get overwhelmed, and people just back off. Well, I think that's that's the nature of these kind of things, right? You know, we certainly don't pretend that people are going to be thinking about that, that everybody's going to be thinking about Puerto Rico all the time. But I would highly encourage people to do something very similar about the Bahamas. This is part of the problem with this type of disaster. You know, it happens; it's in the news for a couple of weeks, and then people forget about it. And you know, this is what we felt like we personally couldn't do this with Puerto Rico. I mean, it, it matters too much to us. And you know, you could say the same thing about an earthquake in Mexico. You could yeah. say the same thing about any other hurricane that's going to hit anywhere else in the Caribbean in the next few, because they're getting bigger. I don't, I mean, the, the storm, the, 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 we should have actually mentioned Bahamas at the beginning of this talk just to say we're very conscious of the fact that something very similar is going on in the Bahamas right now. And the Not destruction worse. Is, is, is worse, worse, which is really hard to believe. I mean, one of the problems with Bahamas, of course, is the very flat islands, so there were no mountains to even break the winds up. That's part of the reason why I just stayed there. And, you know, yeah, there is the worry that the Bahamas story is going to fade out of the news in a few days, too, and people won't do anything or care about it. And, and the thing is that, you know, we, we can all send checks, we can give money, and many of us do that kind of stuff. But we felt personally for this particular storm and the way that it impacted us personally, the way that it impacted our families, our friends, uh, the island, you know, almost four million fellow citizens in the United States, we felt like we had to do something, something that was long lasting. And this is you know, kind of what we've done. And, and it's something that, that I think important. The engaged scholarship will never work if it doesn't plug in to the expertise of the faculty members. So you know, we're literature professors, but we're experts on Puerto Rico. So somehow, we're taking advantage of our positions at a top 20 university with a big endowment to produce something that's lasting and that will have, an, uh, hopefully, a long time impact, at least on some people, about Puerto Rico. I don't know if you want to add. Thank you. Uh, website and see what's been going on. If, like me, you've listened to this and watched this with absolute rapt attention and profound admiration for the work that Tom and Marisol have been doing in this, and believe you me, I've done it, I know just how much hard work goes into creating one of those courses. Whatever number of hours anybody tells you, you multiply by at least four uh, before you get anywhere near it happening. But you think, you were sitting there thinking, I wish some of my friends had heard what was being said today. We film Saturday Scholars, we post them up on the Saturday Scholars website. Usually it takes us about a week or two before it goes up there, and then they stay up there. So please do pass that on to people on, from the nd.edu website, Saturday Scholars. They can watch and experience this wonderful event. Thank you both Thank you. very much.